Hi, everyone. I'm here with my friend Al Fadi, and uh, we've just recorded a lot of shows about arguments for Islam. And uh, I was with you on a show years ago that, you, that we recorded over, uh, over Skype, but I've never seen your testimony. And I know that you're a former Muslim, that you grew up in Saudi Arabia, but right. beyond that, I don't really know much. So I figure this would be a great time to learn. So uh, why don't you start by telling us what your life was like in Saudi Arabia growing up? Well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, brother. It's always a privilege and an honor to serve the Lord with you. I am uh, always thankful for the material you produce all the time uh, for the sake of my people to find the truth. And thank you so much for uh, your hard labor. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, I am a former Muslim from Saudi. That's where I was born and raised. And uh, as you know, brother, Saudi Arabia really has a special place when it comes to Islam, simply because it's the birthplace of Islam. And I just happened to be born, uh, basically, and raised in a town near Mecca. So there was this bond, uh, not only to Islam and its uh, uh, origin, but also uh, my uh, close proximity to Mecca, uh, and as you know, Islam is a religion of works. Therefore, more good deeds you do, uh, more chances you have in, in order for you to uh, earn your way to heaven. And being near Mecca, that means that I can always go and do the rituals and, and the things that are required of me, simply even praying in Mecca most of the time uh, for that purpose. As I was basically growing up, I began to study more and more Islam at a deeper level. Now, not all Muslims, by the way, you're going to meet, even from Saudi, uh, are that religious. I want to be fair. Not all of them are that devout. But the tendency for people in Saudi to be devout, if you wish, is much higher than you find it in other areas outside of Saudi Arabia, simply because Islam is really emphasized in there, not only at the school level, not only at the college level, but also it is emphasized uh, by the way of life in there and the Sharia law application and so many aspects uh, basically of life in there. So this is how I was raised basically and that was the environment I grew up in. And obviously something changed at some point. So, uh, and you're here. So I, I know even without you telling me that a couple of things changed. Um, so what, what changed first? Did you did you leave Saudi Arabia first, or did you start doubting Islam while in Saudi Arabia? Well, actually, right before I left uh, to come uh, to basically to the West for my graduate education, I finished my uh, college back in Saudi with the engineering degree. But the thing is this, um, almost before that happened, uh, during my high school years, I was fascinated with the idea of jihad to the point that I was even seriously considering going to Afghanistan when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. And it was uh, people like Osama bin Laden who left, and many uh, of the young Saudi men left also as well. And therefore, I was fascinated with this idea of not just fighting, but dying as a martyr for all these rewards that I was reading about when it comes to the rewards for martyrdom. Uh, but by the grace of God, uh, I was uh, basically prevented from doing so, and uh, I finished my college. And then I came to the uh, West, and as you know, Muslims are raised to believe that um, all of the Western Hemisphere basically is Christian, uh, maybe with the exception to few that might be Jews, but technically speaking, you are born into a religion called Christianity. And this religion happened to be the one right before Islam. Therefore, it's canceled, it's obsolete. But at the same time, Christians who live in the West, they're immoral. Why? Because their Bible has been corrupted and uh, evidenced by the fact that they have nightclubs, have bars, and you watch, uh, you know, movies and you assume that this is the culture at large as a result of this. So I came to the West with that mindset. But it's almost like within the first month, I believe it or not, I just struggled with the use of idioms. And that led me into uh, basically getting connected through some of the campus ministries with a family that was a born-again believer. That was the first time I've ever heard of such a thing when we were having this spiritual discussions. And it was through that process that my mind began to shift into 
um, basically a willingness and uh, also um, uh, just the desire to learn more about this Christianity that I knew nothing about. Initially, my intent was to convert people to Islam. I didn't really want to learn about it for the sake of leaving Islam, but it, that's how the process began. Wait, so, so you were, you got involved with, uh, with Christians because you were you're trying to work on your your my English speaking idioms, abilities. My English, exactly. Oh wow, that's interesting. So, um, how did how did you come to? doubt Islam, because most Christians that, that you would ever run into generally know very little about Islam, so I, I, I doubt they would have been presenting uh, criticisms of Islam. So okay. how did you come to, to doubt Islam? That is true. Uh, it's uh, after a few months of my encounter with this family, I uh, ended up changing my major. I moved from uh, that uh, place where I was to another place. And I really, I severed my relationship with the family, never bothered to reconnect with them. I uh, graduated, um, got a job offer. Um, and it was uh, years later, I met more people and specifically another family. And it was when I began to engage them in, uh, in discussions about my faith, Islam. In other words, I was inviting them to accept Islam. That's when they began to push back gently, asking me for proof when I said the Bible is corrupt. Uh, asking me for proof when I made claims that Jesus wasn't crucified, and at the same time sharing back with me what does the Bible say, what other evidence that are available, and asking me also to reason uh, about certain facts and, and things of that nature. In other words, they were really countering my arguments uh, with ways to force me to examine and think about the claims that I'm making and in this case, I began to discover slowly and gradually that I'm making really big claims that I cannot back up. And it was through this process that was long process. It took almost 12 years for it uh, because I was definitely uh, an apologetic at heart. Uh, I, I had this zeal for Islam. And of course, I wanted to prove that I was right. Uh, but of course, by God's grace, through this pushback, I began to slowly to doubt Islam until I get to a point where I definitely discovered that either I'm living a big lie or I know nothing about Islam, at least the way I learned it. And that was the turning point, basically. And so what happened after that? I got invited to go to a church a couple of times, and I refused to do so. Um, you know, for obvious reasons, Muslims, of, of course, uh, don't like to go to churches anyway. Uh, and uh, one of it is they're afraid that uh, uh, they'll be uh, seen by others. Uh, sometimes they think God is going to punish them and so on and so forth. I, I spent about a year and a half, give or take, uh, uh, basically in, uh, I call it spiritual vacation. I wasn't fasting. I wasn't praying. I was doing anything. So I, I felt guilty. You know, remember, I mean, uh, I'm religious most of my life. Uh, you don't do any of these rituals, all of a sudden you feel like there's something missing here. You're wired to be religious. But at the same time, I felt also a heavy burden almost like lifted off my shoulder. So I was really in this middle stage. Uh, do I really go back to being religious or why am I feeling relieved at least? And, and it was during that phase when I agreed finally to go to that church. And when I attended the church, I began to hear the gospel being preached from the gospel of John from the pulpit. And all of a sudden, the things that I heard from that very first family 12 years earlier and the other family and others in between somehow began to make more sense. Mm -hmm. The story almost began to make sense, perfect sense, actually. All of that, of course, led me to begin to question myself at a deeper level. Obviously, the Holy Spirit was convicting me already. And as a result of this, really, I felt like at some point I'm going to have to make a decision. And then September 11 happened at the same time. And obviously, being a devout Muslim, uh, I understood perfectly why these hijackers did what they did, of course. Uh, it's uh, uh, their ticket to heaven. That's uh, the way they were thinking about it. At some point in my life, I wanted to die as a martyr. But the devastation of that act was being laid out before my eyes. And I began to see what I myself could have done as well years earlier to others, innocent people, innocent lives. And I began to really ask myself, why would God allow for things like this to happen for the purpose of few just to go to heaven if he is really a God that, that I thought to be the God of peace 
and my religion is a religion of peace. And to top that, that very weekend, I attended the same church, and they preached from the Gospel of Matthew about loving your enemies and praying for those who persecuted you. And that was a very powerful passage because I reminded myself that if the God of the Bible is the God of the Quran, then something drastically happened to this God that he changed his mind about loving your enemies 600 years before the coming of Muhammad, and all of a sudden now it is a command to hate and fight them. Uh, uh, we have to back up a second because I'm a little confused, because on the one hand, you seem like you understand that Islam promotes jihad and martyrdom, but on the other hand, you are saying that uh, Islam is a religion of peace. So is it is it something like the the jihad is is right because you're ultimately striving for uh, for peace and the and the good of the the Islamic community or something like I can imagine if you're if you know if you're the fighting in Afghanistan that right. you know these are Russian invaders and so you're martyring right. yourself to stop the to stop the invaders or something like no, that. No, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, before I reach that point of confusion, of course, certainly uh, I would look at Islam as a religion of peace from a different perspective. Religion of peace in terms of spreading Islam, and that will be the only way to enforce peace. But then when I began to doubt Islam, I definitely I was touched now by what I've seen, and that really was the struggle that I faced. Reminding myself now, I used to think to do things like this, but at the same time, also the opposite side of that, uh, basically, um, uh, belief is that also it's a religion of peace. So how can this be peace? Mm -hmm. Because now I'm witnessing it by myself. And of course, that was a major event, as you know, globally. And that was a turning point, of course, in, ter in terms of people understanding about Islam and its teaching uh, in relationship to jihad. And I've already been heard uh, here in the gospel, and obviously the Holy Spirit was doing his work already in convicting me. So it's the softness inside of me that allow me to, for the first time, to begin to examine things that in the past I accepted, but now it looked totally different to me. And so what was the uh, sort of last straw? The last straw was, certainly it was very important for me to hear that passage being preached. I continued to come to that church for probably another two months or so, but a couple of times during those services, they would call people to, uh, to the altar, of course, and uh, if they want to accept Christ. I almost felt one time tempted to do this. Uh, I didn't know what was uh, forcing me uh, to think that way, uh, but uh, I kept denying uh, my internal, basically, desires to follow along. But uh, it, come to a point, it came to a point where I really wasn't able at all uh, to um, keep resisting. In fact, uh, it, it was coupled also by seeing some sort of a dream. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, typically people, especially Muslim people, are afraid of the idea of death for two reasons. Uh, death means there is a possibility of punishment in the grave. But most importantly, you don't know really if you're going to end up making it to heaven or not. I mean, you still want to keep doing your good deeds. And the, uh, the dream that I was getting, actually, uh, was strange, uh, that I died. And I'm standing before the throne of God, and he's asking me one question. Why have you rejected my son? And that was a question I didn't know the answer to. Yet at the same time, I was already attending the church, and I'm hearing about the son already. And I've seen people accepting the son. And when I've seen this dream a couple of times, happening almost within the span of these two months, it really terrified me. It's almost like I began to think about death. What's going to happen now if I truly die? Uh, w w what is uh, the basically the right path? Is it Islam or is it what I'm hearing? And it's just by the grace of God that I finally um, came to my senses and I realized that I must make that decision to follow Christ. And it wasn't an easy decision, of course, but there we are. And so what happened afterwards? Of course, um, there is always a cost that mm -hmm. comes with this. Um, I lost a lot of things almost immediately. And I have to admit, the first thing that came to my mind is that, did I make the wrong decision? And am I might be being punished by Allah as a result of this. And it goes to show, by the way, the importance of having the right people surround you and disciples. Because of that, the people around me who are believers began to explain to me that this is spiritual warfare. God is not punishing you for coming to him, 
But God could be allowing these things to happen to you because maybe you have issues in the heart that he's working on. Maybe you have pride. Uh, maybe he's preparing you for something big, a ministry or something of that sort. But don't look at it as if he's punishing you. He cannot punish you for coming to him. He is, uh, they be, began to show in passages that heaven is rejoicing that actually, you know, as a sinner, you accepted basically Christ. Uh, so through this process, I began to kind of start to make sense to me. That indeed, yes, there are things inside of me that began to change, um, things that I used to desire. Somehow I began to distance myself from material and stuff that I had affinity uh, for, and I began to learn to be humble. And uh, years later, of course, I look back and I am thankful now for the process that the Lord put me through. Now, uh, you could have just spent the rest of your life uh, working your job, living quietly, and eventually died like that. Uh, but you've decided to focus on ministry and uh, reaching Muslims. Uh, why'd you, why'd you take, take things in that direction? Well, certainly it's God's calling, obviously. Uh, it wasn't just me trying to do something on my own. But here's the interesting thing. I remember the first maybe a uh, few weeks after I became a believer, I was uh, asking God, why did you make me a Muslim all of these years, denying me to know you since day one? Of course, little that I knew that the Lord actually had a ministry for me, and all of these years are not a waste. Because of my upbringing as a Muslim from Saudi Arabia, learning the Quran, learning tafsir, learning all the traditions uh, that uh, basically the Prophet taught and his biography, and almost learning it from the top-notch Islamist gave me that authority when the day came for me to step into ministry. And of course, I looked at it as, since I know the truth now, I owe it to my people to let them know about this truth. And it's amazing how God began to surround me by godly men and women who began to serve me, began to disciple me, began to work on me, our dear brother Sam Shimon was one of them. And watching uh, sometimes your videos with him and others that were other parts of my uh, discipleship process. And of course, the Lord uh, brought me uh, into contacts with others where media door opened up for me. And I began to see the significance, really, of utilizing media to the glory of God if we use it wisely. Because I cannot multiply myself, you cannot multiply yourself, but the message could be spread to millions upon millions of Muslims. And that's really how I began to get involved with ministry that grew from just one-on-one -on -one to teaching at Sunday schools to teaching seminars and all of a sudden get involved with satellite TV and now my own, of course, website, videos, radio show, and the likes, basically. Uh, one last question. Um, you mentioned a situation where you, you saw the 9-11 attacks and decided to uh, rethink things more carefully. Um, I know there are lots of Muslims in the world today who are in that situation because they've seen a lot more than just 9-11. They're seeing uh, what uh, people are doing in the name of Allah um, around the world. Uh, even right now during, during Ramadan, they're seeing uh, the, the constant bombings, the, the, the suicide attacks and so on. And many of them still believe in Islam, but this can become a time of reflection for them, a uh, time to think to themselves, uh, is this religion true? Is, is, is all of this based on um, Islam and is Islam true? And for those Muslims who might be uh, ready to think about this for themselves for the first time, instead of just believing what's been uh, passed down to them, uh, what would you say to them? What I would say is this. Um, they are certainly fortunate today because in my days we didn't have Google. We didn't have Internet, uh, at least as powerful as we have today. Uh, things have developed ever since. Of course, Google came into the equation later in my search, of course. They have access to many, uh, basically, resources online uh, at the privacy of their own uh, uh, home and places. I encourage them to go and examine all evidence available related not only just uh, to Christ and the Bible, but also examine the falsehood and the falsehood, I should say, and the uh, the uh, teachings of Islam 
uh, in contrast to the teaching of the Bible and Christ, and ask themselves this question. What they are witnessing firsthand right now, whether uh, at least themselves, their immediate family, friends, or maybe just what they're watching globally taking place, unfolding right before our eyes, does that make sense? That a religion that everyone think is a religion of peace would cause such chaos globally and since September 11, this chaos continues to intensify to where we are today. Almost every region in the world has been impacted by it. Can truly the God who revealed Islam to be the religion of peace be the same God who is also causing all of this chaos? You see, you cannot pick and choose what the Quran teaches or what the Prophet teaches because ISIS can justify their actions just like people who wants to claim that Islam is a religion of peace can justify their actions. So one side has to be right and one side has to be wrong. And the fact that you have contradictions from within, this should cause them to examine Islam at a deeper level, utilizing all of these resources that are available for them, which I did not have in my days. Well, thank you, brother. And uh, to uh, everyone out there who would like to learn more, um, you can look at the links in the description box. Um, that'll take you to uh, Al-Fadi's YouTube channel, to many more videos by him, and to uh, more details about his uh, background and story. And look forward to uh, hearing much more from you in the future.